This is episode 93 of the Magic Detective Podcast. On this episode, you'll hear about the life of William Fay, the other Davenport brother. That and more on this episode of the Magic Detective Podcast. Hello and welcome to the Magic Detective Podcast, your podcast home for magic history. I'm your host, Dean Carnegie. I am the Magic Detective, and this is episode 93. Well, I took a little break from the podcast and magic history in general. I had to focus on finishing up five weeks of shows, which was intense. Uh, and then when I got home, I um, the very next day that I got home after being on the road for so long, I ended up with a bad chest cold, and which turned into bronchitis, which was no fun. But um, fortunately, um, back in the summer, I was able to finish the Tony Curtis podcast, and um, I really wasn't able to do anything else because all my research material was back in, in um, Nashville, and I was in Virginia, so uh, everything else kind of had to wait. But um, one of the things I did do while I was away, and this is just kind of a fun magic history thing, is I, I took a deep dive into a particular trick, the, uh, the thumb tie. And of course, it's gone by various names over the years, but um, I, I was very interested in it because I very recently saw a video of Alan Shaxon performing the that routine, and I really liked the way he had his his thumbs tied. It just was, it just frankly looked impossible. And I got to thinking about other people that did the thumb tie as well, like uh, Willard the Wizard, who was known to have uh, again a an impossible looking thumb tie. And when I say impossible looking, his thumbs were tied in such a way that there was no way that he could do the, the various, I, I'm just going to call them manifestations. Cause essentially that's kind of what this particular effect is. It's sort of, sort of like a magic effect out of the spiritualism world really. Um, but it's now a stage trick, but how the rings pass through or how poles pass through your tied thumbs it's just uh, remarkable. And so anyway, so I did quite a bit of research on that and found out that there are quite a few methods uh, using wire, using um, zip ties, using rope, using lots of things. So it's certainly had its share of um, uh, variety in that regard. And also it was fun to find some of the, the different bits of business that have been done over the years, many of which have been lost and no longer done. It's not a particularly popular trick today, mainly, I think, because it's also not a particularly easy trick to do. Uh, Alan Shaxon is no longer with us, so obviously he's not doing it. There are, uh, well, there's there's at least one fellow doing it today. I watched a video of him, and I apologize because I would mention his name, but I've forgotten who it is exactly but uh, he does a wonderful job with it and i think um it's going to end up in the carnegie show because it makes a really good addition to um like i already do the linking hula hoops and a couple things with uh, of that nature and i just think that this um thumb tie would be perfect a perfect addition so that's that's one of the kind of the side things that i i did um this summer. But also I had the good fortune of, uh, watching a video and, um, and I don't remember who the fellow was Uh, here again. I should have written it down. I just remembered what he said. He was talking about books and basically his point was, if you have, if you read a book 10 years ago, 20 years ago, uh, you might want to consider picking that book up today and reading it with, with new eyes. And the point was, is essentially you're not the same person today that you were 10 years ago or 20 years ago. Yeah. I mean, there's going to be a lot of things that are still the same about you, but you know, in, in regards to being a magician or a magic historian, you're going to have learned a lot more over the years. If you're a, a magician who does magic, your skill level, I would assume is going to be a lot larger, a lot stronger, a lot better, um, if you don't do sleight of hand, that regardless, maybe you've done, you know, in the last 10 years, the last 20 years, several hundred shows, you're going to be a different performer than you were when you first read this book. So the idea of going back and looking 
with the with new eyes at some of this older material i just thought what a great what a great suggestion and um you know and all of us out there that are magic historians and even those that are just starting to get into magic history and you look at your shelf and you go well you know i've got a few books or and I'm, you know some of us we thousands of books um well there's a bunch of new material for us that we can uh, take a look at and examine and um I know one of my favorite books was uh, Mike Caveney's Carter the Great book. I just, I remember when I first read that and just devoured it. And uh, I'm going to have to dig it out and go through it again because it was so much fun to read the first time. I know uh, looking at it a second time with, uh, again, with with the newer eyes is going to be, uh, it's going to be great. So uh, it's a little bit about what I was doing this summer when I wasn't able to uh, to really do much with the podcast. Um, so let's get into today. Our, our topic today is a little obscure, but if you know uh, even, a, well, frankly, if you know a little bit about magic history, you've probably heard his name. If you've heard of the Davenport brothers, you probably know this person's name. In fact, I've talked about him before on earlier podcasts, um, but my main reason for doing the podcast on him today is to share what this particular person is up to today. Uh, yeah, you heard that correctly, <laughs> and you'll have to wait to the end of the episode to find out exactly what I'm talking about, but let's go ahead and get into today's episode. Our feature today was born William Marion Fay in Darmstadt, Germany in 1839. By age 11, he immigrated to America with his family. Numerous sources say that he had an interest in magic at an early age. Some sources give his name as William Melville Fay. This is incorrect, however. Anna Eva Fay's husband was known as H. Melville Fay, and that name was not real either, but likely appropriated from the original William Marion Fay. Even Houdini mistakenly writes his name as William H. Fay in his book, A Magician Among the Spirits, but it is indeed William Marion Fay, and that is what is recorded on his gravestone. He was a resident of Buffalo, New York, where he became aware of the Davenport brothers. In the 1800s, the spiritualism movement came about because of two sisters and two brothers. The first, the Fox sisters, and the others were Ira and William Davenport. The sisters began in 1848 with strange rapping and pounding sounds. Eventually, it was surmised that these rapping sounds were a form of communication with a ghostly spirit. A system was developed to ask questions and receive replies, depending upon the number of raps and such. The Fox sisters' popularity grew quickly. Not too far away were the Davenport brothers, who read of the sisters' exploits. And Ira Davenport Sr. was curious enough to bring the family together and see if they could experience the same thing. And sure enough, according to the biography, rapping sounds were heard, and this went on for some time. Word got out among the public that uh, what was happening in the Davenport household, and before long they were demonstrating these feats to small groups. In one particular sitting, a message was sent to fire a pistol at the corner of the room. Upon doing so, the claim is, a figure could be seen in the smoke, standing and smiling. As the smoke cleared, so did the apparition. Again, so it was claimed. As with the Fox sisters, who began to tour around and demonstrate their Strange powers, so did the Davenports. Over time, their program changed. At one point, early on, it was claimed that all three children, William, Ira Erastus, and their sister, all levitated some nine feet into the air during a dark seance. Spectators present could reach up and feel their levitated bodies. This was done in complete darkness. The tours became longer, the demonstrations more elaborate, and somewhere they stumbled upon the tying feat, which was incorporated into the program. William Fay was around the same age as the two brothers. According to the biography of the Davenport brothers by Thomas Nichols, M.D., 
one of his first evidences he gave of being attended by extraordinary manifestations was when playing with other boys being raised bodily from the ground and lodged into a neighboring tree in sight of all of his companions. He, William Fay, joined the Davenport brothers during their visit to Oswego in upstate New York. Now, I'm not saying this incident of floating up into the air is fact. I'm just relaying what is in the Davenport Brothers biography. And keep in mind, this is not an autobiography, but a biography written by Thomas Nichols, M.D. However, the information was given to Nichols by the brothers and backed up by newspaper accounts from the time. The reason that William Fay was hired was twofold. One was to act as manager of the act, and two, as a backup performer, in case he was needed to fill in for one of the brothers. Surely the events of Oswego were a trial by fire. The test began with the brothers being tied with 90 feet of rope. Then copper wire was added to the ropes to make escape impossible. The boys were then placed into the cabinet. In about nine minutes, the older brother was completely free of his bonds. But upon inspection, the younger brother was still securely tied. The cabinet closed again, and this time, after a short period, the doors were opened and the younger brother was seen to be free. William Fay joined the brothers at a private circle for about 40 attendees, and here the brothers and Fay sat at a long table. The committee then tied their wrists with white cotton thread many times and with many knots. Then the long end of the thread was tacked to a tabletop. This was done for each one of them. To add another layer of security, the tacks were then covered in wax to show that uh, they hadn't been removed. Next, instruments like a guitar, a mandolin, a tambourine, and bells and such were placed on the table, but put out of reach of the three gentlemen. Next, the spectators, keep in mind, the spectators were tied with rope so that no one in the room could be accused of manipulating the instruments and causing them to play or rise or move. And yet, when the lights were extinguished, that is exactly what was heard. Strumming sounds, ringing sounds, and the like. When the lights were brought back up, the three gentlemen, the Davenport brothers and Faye, were seen to be sitting quietly, still, with the ropes severely tied on their wrists, or in this case, the thread tied about their wrists. Their next seance would find them in deep trouble. It was a private seance, but in truth it was more of a setup. As even before the troop began to do their thing, law enforcement interrupted the proceedings and arrested the Davenports and Fay. They were quickly brought before a magistrate and accused of performing without a license. Magicians, jugglers, circuses, menageries all required a license. The Davenports argued that they were presenting a concert because of the instruments. The judge, however, decided that they should pay a fine or be imprisoned. The Davenports, after a little bit of reflection upon the situation, decided to remain imprisoned as they felt their rights were being denied, especially the right of free practice of religion. They remained jailed for 29 days. The guards were very lenient and allowed them to have visitors and even conduct seances in their cells. There is no mention of William being arrested, but as he did start with them in Oswego, it's safe to assume that he was in jail with them as well. Houdini mentions in his book, A Magician Among the Spirits, that William Fay always kept an extra piece of rope hidden in his mandolin in case of emergencies. What were those emergencies? Well, it may be a situation where they were tied up and they weren't able to free themselves. They could cut their way out and then have that extra piece of rope to show that they, well, were free, but didn't cut themselves out. Kind of clever. Earlier, when I said that William Fay joined the brothers, I should clarify, he joined the company. He was a backup performer to William Henry Davenport, who was known to be rather sickly. And he would slowly take over as company manager. He would learn all the aspects of the Davenport business, both the show and the business parts. The year was 1864. Eventually, Fay would replace the Davenport's father as manager, and the troop would head over to England. 
In their programs, the two brothers were usually tied within the large cabinet. But it appears, if I'm reading this right, that Mr. Fay wasn't always in the cabinet as well, but sometimes tied to a chair outside of the cabinet. One particular sequence, which can be credited to Fay, is this. He would be tied to a chair. Uh, his legs would be tied to the legs of the chair. His wrists tied behind his back, totally immovable. The lights would be struck, and then a strange whizzing noise was heard. And only a few seconds later, he would yell, It's off! Then the lights were brought back up, and Faye was still securely tied to the chair, but his coat was laying on a table in front of him. Next, a volunteer, a spectator from the audience, submitted their coat, which would be laid on the same table in front of Faye. The lights again would be turned off, and then that whizzing sound was heard. And just like before, when the lights came back up, the borrowed coat was found on Mr. Faye, who was again still tied securely to the chair. In 1869, a young man by the name of Harry Keller joined the troupe. It appears that he took over the managing job from William Fay. Fay was still with the company. In 1873, Keller had a falling out with William Henry Davenport and abruptly quit, but he didn't go alone, as William Fay left the employment of the Davenports as well and went with Harry Keller. The two performers joined forces in the spring of 1873 and began to tour the United States, calling themselves Fay and Keller probably because William Fay was older than Harry and probably had more performing experience. Harry Keller would do the act that he learned while working with the Fakir of Ava, and then the conclusion of the show would be the recreation of the Davenport Cabinet, or what is known today as the Spirit Cabinet. The act apparently was not an immediate success, as lack of money left them occasionally stranded. One big difference, however, was the way the cabinet was presented. In the Davenport Brothers program, it was presented not as a magic trick. The boys never claimed supernatural powers either. They left it kind of ambiguous and up to the audience to decide. But they clearly leaned towards the side of the supernatural. Keller would have the cabinet presented more as a trick. In fact, he often included spirit exposure routines in his show a vast difference over the Davenports. Their luck would change, however. Keller secured some dates for them in Cuba. And at the Albizu Theater in Havana, it was said they made over $3,000 during their first night on stage. Success continued for Faye and Keller on their tour of Cuba. From there, the two went to Mexico and again met with great success. To cut down on their travel expenses, they hit upon a novel idea of leaving the spirit cabinet behind in each city they played and simply having a new one built when they got to their next destination. Back in this time, the spirit cabinet was just that, a very large wooden cabinet. There was nothing faked or gimmicked about it, so having the locals build a new one was rather easy. From Mexico, they sailed on to South America and toured all over the country. The tour of South America was successful with the exception of a couple weeks in December of 1874. By July 1875, the South American tour was complete and Fay and Keller got on board the steamship called the Boyan and set sail for Portugal. On August 18, 1875, the Boyan hit ground near the Ushant Island and sank in the Bay of Biscay. The Ushant Island is just off the coast of France. This area of the Bay of Biscay has claimed numerous ships over the years. The Boyne wasn't the first ship to go down and wouldn't be the last. Faye and Keller survived the shipwreck, but they lost all of their belongings and show props and money. It's been recorded that they lost a combined $40,000. And this marks the end of the Faye and Keller partnership. They both returned to England, headed their separate ways afterwards. Keller was determined to rebuild his act, so he went his way, while Faye lucked out and rejoined the Davenport brothers, who had just arrived back in England. They toured throughout England and then on to India, New Zealand, and Australia. In 1877, William Henry Davenport, who had suffered from poor health for years, 
died in Sydney. His brother Ira Davenport returned to the United States. William Fay then returned to Australia and settled down in Melbourne. He married Eliza Lydia, and together they had one son, Franklin. In 1895, Ira contacted Fay about the prospect of starting up the show again. This time it would be Davenport and Fay. The Sphinx magazine mentions that at one point, Davenport and Fay, as well as Harry Keller, were all performing in Washington, D.C. at the same time, though Keller's act was anti-spiritualists and even put down the Davenports as part of the cabinet routine, the three individuals still remained on good terms. Sadly, Davenport and Fay was not a big success. Either their performances were below the standards of their youth or just behind the times. Whatever the case, they threw in the towel rather quickly. Ira retired to Mayville, New York. William Fay went back to Australia. Whenever Harry Keller was on tour in Australia, he would make a point to visit his old friend and partner. One year, he spent Christmas holidays with the Fays. Houdini also visited William Fay in 1910. And I have a feeling there's a lot more to learn about William Fay in the letters that Houdini wrote following that visit. There's a reference to a letter in the A Magician Among the Spirits, but Houdini doesn't go into great detail. So uh, perhaps in David Copperfield's big collection, there is uh, a lot more information on the latter days of William Fay. Uh, William Fay invested in real estate. One source says he raised sheep. Another said he opened a general store. But the end result of it all, he became rather wealthy. William Marion Fay died on July 16th in 1921 at the ripe old age of 81. He was buried in the Melbourne General Cemetery along with the rest of his family. Now you might think that's the end of it, but no. Fast forward to 2023, in fact only a short time ago. I was contacted by a relative of William Fay, a descendant. She shared with me a most unsettling situation. She also revealed a couple things I found fascinating. Apparently, William, back when he was alive, wrote a book of his exploits for the family. This book still remains in the family's possession, and from what I'm told, is highly guarded. Even the woman sharing this information said she's not been allowed to read it, as family members, well, the ones that have the book, uh, refuse to let it out of their possession. She also has some articles belonging to Fay artwork, furniture, even the bed he slept in. She claims sleeping in that bed will give you the wildest dreams of your life, I can only imagine. But that is not the craziest thing. Back in May of 2023, she was caring for her 90-year-old father. While at home, the lights in the house went out. She went outside and noticed that all the street lights and all the lights on the other houses were still on. She walked back in, and the lights came back on, but now were flickering. The TV was turning off and on. The lights upstairs, which were previously off, were now suddenly on. She ventured upstairs to turn the lights off, and the moment she got up there, the lights went off again, on their own. When she would walk back downstairs, they'd all come back on. This began to happen all over the house. Various rooms would be bright with light and then suddenly dark. An alarm on the refrigerator that lets you know the door has been open started going off, except the door had been closed. This continued for some time. It continued until she had had enough. Rather than be scared or elated, she was pissed. She yelled out some profanities, directed right at the spirit of her ancestor, basically saying to knock it the F off. And to her surprise, all the manifestations stopped at that very instant, and things went back to normal. No explanation for what caused this craziness. Now, that's a great story, but she also had the wherewithal to video part of it, and I've seen the video, and it is crazy wild. So, William Fay is apparently still out there trying to entertain, at least in some capacity. And it sure makes for a great tale, 
one without an explanation. And you can believe it or disbelieve it. It doesn't matter. It's still a great story. Though I would suggest if it happens again, they might want to call an electrician. And that, my friends, is going to do it for this episode of the Magic Detective Podcast. And by the way, if you enjoy the podcast, please consider giving it a like or a thumbs up or a five-star review or whatever your provider allows. And I will be back very soon with another episode very, very shortly. Trying to get a couple more episodes in before we start season six in late October. Until then, I'm Dean Carnegie. I am the Magic Detective. Thank you for listening. Please be well and stay safe.